Chapter 20 His leg hurt. His shoulders hurt. Hell, everything hurt. Noble made his way to the cargo area, wincing and half asleep. The auto doc had pumped him full of new nannies and enough anti-inflammatory assistance to keep the swelling down. But even with all that chemical assistance, he still felt as though his leg were being broken again and again. Well, no, it wasn't quite that bad, but God damn it, it ached. Between the broken rib, his bruised chest, and the fucked leg, he should have been lying down on the auto dock, blissfully stoned and watching hollows through his block. If they were back at Trident Station, that's exactly what he'd be doing. Instead, he was heading to the cargo hold again. And once more, he had to find a rather unorthodox solution to an unorthodox problem. Noble activated his block and watched Copenhaver's main cam feed. The private and her squad mate had finished securing and checking the spindle. All green across the board. Black could have told them that, and did. But considering how old the equipment was, visual inspection of the couplings as well as the sensor array was SOP. Copenhaver's camera jiggled slightly as she mag-grabbed the hull and pushed herself into the airlock opening. The view turned and faced the rectangular opening in the hull. Stars filled the world beyond, mirrors damaged, uneven hull laid out like kilometers of metal floor. The rectangular opening disappeared as the airlock shut. He disconnected from the feed. Private? Noble called over the comms. You in? Aye, sir. She said. Hold is pressurized and we're removing our gear. He grinned. Be there in a minute. Very good, sir. She said. Damn, but he liked her. A twinge of pain shot up his leg, making him wince. Fucking pine cones. Fucking starfish. Fucking Mira. He hoped the captain blasted this void for second ship to shards. He reached the cargo hold entrance, checked the indicators for pressure readings, and commanded the door open. It slid aside with a whisper, and he walked into the large, brightly lit space. Copenhaver and Murdoch had slipped off their gloves and helmets, but neither had removed their suits. Both the helmets and the gloves had been maglocked to the wall next to the airlock door. Noble thought the urge to smile. A good idea keeping the gear close like that. If either of the Marines had to return outside in a hurry, they could don the rest of their suit in a heartbeat. The two Marines turned to face him, each of them at parade rest. Noble pointed at the wall. Whose idea was that? Hers, sir, Murdoch said. Well, it's a damn good one, Copenhaver. Thank you, sir, she said losing the fight to keep a smile from her face. Now, I assume you're wondering why you're in here. The two Marines glanced at one another, but said nothing. We have a slight change in plans, Noble said. I don't know everything, but we need to build a sled. Copenhaver blinked. A sled, sir? Aye, Noble said. He walked past them to the printer, connected his block to the machine, checked the loaded materials, and tapped a finger on the control panel. Marines, bring me a crate of tungsten, a crate of Atmo, and another of Plasteel. Let's get this party started. While the two Marines retrieved the three crates and placed them in the printer hoppers, Noble connected to Black. He had a general design in mind, but wanted the AI to vet it. He still didn't trust her, but the captain still did. Noble bit his lip. The very idea of taking advice from the computer left him cold. Although she'd probably saved his life as well as that of the captains and gunny squad, Black's loyalty was still an open question. She'd lied to them, he was sure of it. And if an AI was capable of lying, what else was it capable of? The AI responded at once. Yes, Lieutenant. I'm sending you the sled design, he said. We'll need to fine-tune it. Very good, sir, Black said. He transmitted the specifications from his block and waited. Black confirmed the design had been received, and Noble tapped his foot while she analyzed it. The computer thought for about three seconds before returning the document to him. Noble accepted the updated file and brought it full screen on his block hood. The cargo hold disappeared as he entered virtual space. The sled materialized in front of him, lit in strong ambient light. Locked in the block simulation, he barely felt his face light up with a smile. The sled, and what could possibly be a better name for it, very much resembled the standard SFMC skiff, only smaller and with more engines. The rectangular skiff's smooth surface was little more than a quarter meter thick before beginning to rise a full meter from the aft and a meter below. Black had added the engines to the aft portion for effect, as well as maneuvering thrusters on its sides. Just before the engine placements, a round metallic dais rose a few centimeters from the flat deck. It was nearly two meters in diameter. 
Noble stared at it through the block connection. He sent commands to the block and the sled rotated so he was able to inspect all four sides. The fore portion also had space for tiny thrusters. Noble practically chuckled out loud. Two things, Black, he said through the connection. That dais, is it for the beacon? Yes, Lieutenant, Black said. She sounded amused. According to the specifications logged in the mirror records, that dais should be large enough to accommodate the beacon. We will have to orient it properly on the sled to aim the exosolar artifact toward the outer Kuiper belt. Why is that? Noble asked. If the beacon should activate while aboard the sled, I don't think we want it pointed toward the inner soul system. Noble, mind racing, paused a beat. The beacon had attracted the life forms. It had emitted several photon bursts before they arrived, and one since. There was no telling when it would erupt in another siren song and possibly bring in more creatures. We have any idea how the device works? Not exactly, Black said. It's apparent to me, as it was to Dr. Thomas Reed, that the beacon's photon bursts in some ways call the creature. Although I don't understand how it may function, it's possible the beacon's energy emissions act as a trail for exosolar life forms to follow. To follow? Noble shivered. So you think they're traveling in the soul system because they're following the beacon? Yes, Black said. It's possible they've been following the beacon for the past 43 years. Noble whistled aloud. Through the block connection, the sound might as well have happened on another planet. That meant... If that's the case, how many creatures are on their way here now? Unknown, Black said. Without better sensors and a much larger telescopic array at our disposal, it's impossible to even guess. However, our detection of multiple KBOs heading this way does seem a little too coincidental. He'd suddenly forgotten all about the pain in his leg and chest. Black was laying out a threat assessment and it wasn't good. If Mira had left a long enough and wide enough trail, millions of those pinecone things, the starfish, and whatever the hell else lived beyond Seoul, might be coming this way even now. An invasion, he thought. An invasion of life forms we know nothing about. Have you told the captain this? Of course, Black said. He is aware of the possible threat. Possible threat. More like probable, Noble thought silently. A shiver crawled down his spine. The urge to make a connection to Dunn, to ask him just what the fuck he thought he was doing, was difficult to resist. Why don't we just send the fucking thing back out of Soul System? Black paused for a moment. The sled disappeared from the block connection as though it had never been there. Left in the darkness, Noble felt as though he were floating through the emptiness of space. Stars began to appear in the distance, their twinkling light calming him, making him feel moored. A shape appeared, and he immediately recognized it. Mira looking as new as she had the day she departed from Trident Station, floated before the stars. The creatures have been on their way for some time, Black said, at least according to the data Calimura's squad recovered. Depending on how many there are, they may also be attracted to Soul's dim light. Noble's eyes blinked despite the fact it was only in a simulation. You think they could hone in on Soul's photon emissions and enter deeper into Soul system? That is exactly what I believe, Black said. Based on my simulations, and please forgive their accuracy and my assumptions, exosolar life may follow the trail to inhabited systems and easily overrun them. Void wept, Noble said. So how is this going to fix it? Sending the artifact to Pluto, an uninhabited and uninhabitable dwarf planet, makes the most sense if we are attempting to corral the creatures. If the beacon continues to blast its signal, the photon streams will be stronger than the photon trails emitted by Sol. Therefore, the creatures will continue to pursue the beacon and hopefully stay rooted on Pluto rather than travel in system. Noble shook his head. There's a lot of ifs here, Black. Yes, Lieutenant. The AI agreed. If you have another suggestion, I'm interested to hear it. Typical Black, he thought to himself. Give you the lowdown and dare you to find a better solution. I don't have one at this time, Noble admitted. I guess I don't have much time to come up with an alternative. Black said nothing. Noble sighed. Okay, here's the other question I have. Why do we have thrusters at the fore? Fine attitude adjustment? Yes, Black said. If we have to change the sled's trajectory or speed before it impacts with Pluto, it will be impossible without additional thruster placements. How much juice are we talking? Enough nitrogen to spin the sled in 360-degree rotations a maximum of 10 times. He nodded to himself. Okay, Noble said. I think that's the only question. Besides how we're getting the void damn beacon out of Mira's engine compartment. That, 
Black said. It's something we are working on. I'll bet, he said. I'll send the design to the printer and fine-tune as we go. Very good, Lieutenant. Noble disconnected from the block and found himself staring at the two Marines standing at parade rest. At ease, people, Noble chuckled. He looked over at the hopper. While he'd been in virtual space with Black, Copenhaver and Murdoch had loaded the materials into the hopper. The printer was all but ready to go. He activated the printer via his block and checked the design upload. As expected, the updated blueprints were in memory. Thank you, Black, he whispered. Okay, Marines, here's what's going to happen. Since my leg is foobar, you're going to follow instructions and we're going to assemble this thing together. Understood? Aye, sir, they yelled, their voices echoing around the nearly empty cargo bay. Get the tools, kiddies. This is going to take time and we don't have much. Copenhaver and Murdoch didn't quite run to the supply cabinets, but they certainly walked fast. Noble ran one last check on the printer status and health report. All green. Let's do it, he muttered, and activated the machine. Chapter 21 Despite the anxiety in his stomach, Calby grinned. Murdoch and Copenhaver were out of harm's way, or at least as much as they could be in the ass end of space surrounded by exosolar things that wanted to kill you. Shit, nothing was safe out here. Not even the void-damned KBOs. Calby to Gunny, over. Gunny here, sir. He flipped to Gunny's feed. Like and Gunny were walking on Mira's surface, the two Marines checking the lines. I have good news for you. Aye, sir. Well, that would be a change. Talby laughed. Get back in the skiff. The captain's 86 the to toe. After a momentary pause, Gunny growled into the mic. Outstanding, sir. Yeah, I thought you'd like that, he said. I'm about 60 seconds from your position at present speed. As soon as you're loaded up, fire up that skiff and get back to black at best speed possible. Acknowledged, sir. I'll shadow you on the way back. Cover your ass. Very good, sir, Gunny said. Cart right out. He shut off Gunny's feed and returned his attention to his surroundings. The seconds ticked off while he cycled through the feeds. According to his sensors, the skiff had begun moving away from her position and back to black. Good. All he had to do was follow their new trajectory, turn the 52 around when he reached their path, and follow... Proximity alert. Flashed on his HUD. Next, a radiation symbol glowed bright red. Radiation alert. Rad levels rising. Talby cursed and checked the radar. Nothing. You kidding me? He yelled. 360 degree radar and you can't fucking see it? A cold chill ran down his spine. Radiation. Hadn't he had a radiation spike just before the starfish? Something crashed into the hull and sent the SV-52 into a biaxial spin. Talby cried out as his HUD flashed yellow and red. Whatever had hit him had damaged the SV-52's bilge. Atmosphere drained from a puncture in the Atmos steel and he found himself on suit life support. Talby's HUD status glowed with the words, Radiation warning. If whatever irradiating the ship didn't move soon, RADs would break through the radiation shielding. After that, all he'd have to combat it would be his suit, and he wouldn't last long at those levels. He hit the thrusters to get the roll under control. It took five microburns to have an effect. He waited for the craft to stabilize before hitting the thrusters again. Two seconds later, something smacked the hole directly beneath the cabin. Talby cursed. Void, but he wanted to look at the cam feeds. Unfortunately, he was too busy trying to get the craft under control. Another set of thruster bursts, and he finally got the roll under control, but the SV-52 was still tumbling end over end. Another bang on the hull. The pilot's seat thumped and jumped from the impact. The rad levels were nearly through the shield. Can't even eject, he thought. If whatever that is doesn't kill me first, my suit is going to fry. Talby touched the thrusters again and managed to get the tumble under control. The SV-52 was nearly stable again, but the vibrations from the hull beneath him continued. The structural integrity was at less than 50%. In a moment or two, the SV-52's bilge would split open like a rotten fruit. Black, I'm in big trouble, he shouted through the comms. The few milliseconds it took for the AI to reply seemed like an eternity. A creature has attached itself to your hull, Lieutenant. Tell me something I don't know, Talby shouted. Something tinged off the hull, followed by a storm of vibrations beneath him and on the port side. Shards of flechettes bounced harmlessly off the canopy. 
Black, what the... Gunny Cartwright's squad is providing cover fire, Black said, her voice maddeningly calm and level. I'm sending you a flight path. An instruction set appeared on his block. He pushed away the panic, ignored the screaming alerts, and focused. The AI's orders included thruster numbers and amounts of fuel to release for each. Talby began running through the list, hitting the thrusters in sequence, pausing when instructed. The SV-52 bucked as it swiveled in space, then rolled and flipped again. As another round of flechettes exploded in the dizzying tumble of space, he wondered dimly why he'd even bothered to get the craft stable if they were now trying to send him completely out of control. But he wasn't out of control, and some part of him knew it. Black would keep him alive. At least he hoped so. Chapter 22 Gunny, Black said through the comms. Lieutenant Talby is under attack. He froze just as he was about to pour on the thrusters to reach the ship. A new feed popped up on his HUD. The camera view from SNR Black focused in on the SV-52. It was no longer above him or even attempting to intersect with their flight path. Instead, the support vehicle tumbled through space, heading further and further from both Mira and SNR Black. Gunny slowed the skiff, his mouth open in a wide O of surprise and horror. Something black and blurred had attached itself to the craft's bilge. Long arms, or tentacles, radiated outward from its center. A pair of the arms pulled back before striking at the SV-52's armor. Through the magnified view, he saw flakes of Atmos steel falling away from the hull, tumbling and dancing in the ZG. God damn it! Gunny yelled. He sent the coordinates to the squad. Went! Get that cannon pointed toward the SV-52! Aye, Gunny. Like, you're the spotter. Keep looking for more threats and update us if anything twitches. Aye, Gunny. Black, how much damage will the new flechette rounds cause? To the hull? The AI asked, and then answered. These are not armor-piercing rounds, she said. Fire at will. You heard the lady, Gunny said. Went. Put out some chaff, but try not to hit the canopy. Aye, Gunny. He turned the skiff away from his previously plotted course and up the speed. Instead of traveling across the midships, he was now moving towards Mira's bow. As they traveled over the damaged hull, Gunny fought to keep his eyes focused on the skiff's fore and bilge cam feeds. He wanted to know what was happening to the SV-52, but he had to make sure he didn't pilot them into a damaged deck plate or a field of pine cones. The skiff vibrated again and again as Went fired the cannon, rounds of flechettes streaking over Gunny's head toward their target. He glanced quickly at Black's zoomed-in cam feed of the SV-52. The creature had completely enveloped the SV-52 in a death grip, two of its arms striking the hull, while the rest gripped the craft as if it were trying to pry open a shell. A flechette round detonated near the creature, and its two free arms spun wildly as if to grab the flechette shards out of the air. Gunny! Wint said. It's not letting go! Keep firing! Gunny yelled, his eyes once more fixed on the four screens. They'd reached the bow's edge in a few moments, but the SV-52 continued spinning off into space. Gunny increased the magnetics and slowed the skiff. Wint, we're losing time here! Wint said nothing in return, but a fresh salvo of flechettes erupted their rocket engines igniting and streaking through the twilight darkness before peppering the SV-52 with shards of Atmos steel and heavy water. Gunny didn't see the first one strike the creature, nor the second. Wint had tightened his pattern, focusing on the craft's damaged fuselage. With the SV-52 tumbling and spinning through space, there was little else Wint could do. Gunny just hoped one of the flechette rounds didn't break through the canopy and strike Talby. The armor should make that impossible, but this was Mira and anything was possible, especially the worst-case scenario. Oh, shit, Wint said. Gunny, it's breaking through the hole. Keep at it, Gunny yelled. Keep firing until I tell you to stop. Wint followed orders. The skiff had reached the edge of Mira's bow. He'd taken the craft as far as he could without flying off into space after the SV-52. He checked the fuel status and grimaced. They had more than enough fuel to get back to SNR Black and more than enough to reach Talby. The problem was that if Talby had to eject, Gunny wouldn't know the direction, trajectory, or speed of the escaping pilot. Getting too close to the SV-52 was also dangerous. The creature could let go of it and charge the skiff, or they could get caught in its radiation field. The skiff didn't have the same armor or radiation protection the SV-52 did, and without that, they would be boiled alive in their suits. With the skiff halted, he brought the feed of the SV-52 to main HUD display. 
The creature looked different from the other starfish. Larger, certainly. But the creature's shell or skin or whatever the fuck it was was so black it practically made a hole in the dark sky. A black hole, Gunny thought. Couldn't possibly be darker than that. The creature's outline vibrated, sparkling at the edges, but had no definition to it. And Soul's bare, dim light did little to illuminate the thing's surface. It just sucked in the light as though it was absorbing it, feeding off it. Five more flechette rounds exploded in twinkles of light. The SV-52's hull lighting up its sparks with secondary detonations of heavy water and metallic shards. The creature bucked and pumped, its arms sliding across the craft's surface as it fought for purchase. Keep it up! Gunny said. It was working, or at least he thought it was. The creature seemed to be twisting the SV-52 in a new trajectory, and then it let go, one arm slashing across the hull in a final gouge. The starfish-like thing loosed itself from the SV-52, turned in the void, and suddenly faced the skiff. The thing knew what had hurt it, and now it was coming for payback. Gunny watched it for a second in horrified wonder as he tried to imagine how the thing could move like that in the frozen ZG of deep space. And then, it was streaking toward the skiff, its body so black it made the distant stars wink out one by one. He hit the throttle and gas erupted from the four thrusters, pushing the skiff backward. Midships, he thought. Have to get back to the midships. Make it come lower. With the magnetics near full strength, the skiff hovered above Mira's hull at less than half a meter. If he went too fast, he risked the skiff getting caught on fractured hull plates or other debris. Gunny cursed and adjusted the mags. The skiff rose another half meter. It was going to be tight once he reached the intersection of the bow and midships. As he looked through the skiff's rear cam feed and saw the massive rent and a rapidly approaching deck plate, he could do nothing but yell at Wint to keep firing at the creature and pray to the void they could stop it before it ran into them like a missile.